Right, we're going to talk about modelling flow now. Now, after completing this module, you'll be able to uh, describe the three models, the three flow models our software can be used for, uh, describe the sources of inaccuracy within these three models, uh, work out which model's best for hydraulics analysis, and also list some of the limitations in our software and therefore understand where sources of divergence from reality may actually occur. So moving straight on, there are three widely used hydraulic models in the oil industry. These are number one, Bingham Plastic, two, Power Law, which is also called some, in some cases the Oswald Duval model after the person that uh, developed it. Uh, the Herschel Bulkley model, uh, developed by Mr. Herschel and Bulkley, and uh, it's also called the Yield Power Law and sometimes the Modified Power Law. And these are in no particular order, by the way. <clears throat> there are also some other models which uh, you might come across, like the Casson model and the Robertson Stiff model. But I'm not actually going to go into those because our software doesn't utilize them at all, so I don't see any point in really dwelling on them at all. Um, what I want to go through is the three models that you actually will come across when you're using our software. And as I said, three widely used models, Bingham, Power Law and Herschel Bulkley. If you have a look in Insight, we've got Bingham Plastic, Power Law and Herschel Bulkley in a pull down menu under Calculation mod module, uh, Model. Rather. <clears throat> in Well Plan, we've got Bingham Plastic, Power Law, Herschel Bulkley and we've also got Newtonian. I'll explain that in a minute as well. But basically, these three, three models are there. And we've got Bingham, Power Law and Yield Power in, in uh, the software called Planet as well. Or you can have a look at prior run data as well, but the three actual models that you can use are Bingham Power Law and Yield Power Law. So the three bits of software you're likely to come across uh, very commonly, there are other bits of software like DFG Plus and so on, which uh, just uses one of these models, but um, three, three, mod, uh, three bits of software you're likely to come across on, on a daily basis are these three, and you've got three models within them. And before we actually launch into discussion of the three models, we must first define the terms which actually allow us to describe flow. First set of terms are shear stress and shear rate. And then there's also the flow regime, laminar, intermediate, and turbulent. I'm not going to talk too much about laminar, intermediate, and turbulent flow regimes in this particular section. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to define shear stress and shear rate. Now, looking at shear stress and shear rate, they're related, obviously. Um, Shear stress is normally defined by the symbol tau. Here we've got a capital tau, which is basically the same as a capital T, uh, which is basically frictional drag, which is force divided by area. And the shear rate is basically um, the difference in velocities divided by the distance of separation. Now what I mean by that, if you actually look at this diagram here, if you imagine these as like two, two plates with a piece of fluid between them, you could imagine this is a glass plate and this is a glass plate. and um, if you move one over the other, there's a relative difference in velocities. If this one's static and this one's moving, there's a difference in velocity. There's a separation between the plates, which is your um, dy, which is uh, the uh, distance apart. And the difference in velocities is dv. So uh, if they're both moving, but one's moving faster than the other, then you've still got a dv, a, a, a change in velocity between the two. So if you divide the difference in the velocities between these two plates by the distance of separation, which is dy, then that's, that, that, that would give you the shear rate. The velocity divided by the distance gives you, uh, well, actually, velocity divided by distance gives you a per unit time value. And that's, 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 how you, that's the units of shear rate. Now, the, the relationship of shear stress to shear rate defines the flow behavior. And the flow behavior, uh, the, the relationship of shear stress to shear rate is also known as viscosity. Now if the ratio is linear, then the fluid is called Newtonian. Uh, you'll see this on, you see this graphically and so on shortly. If the, if the relationship's linear, then the, the fluid is, is a Newtonian fluid. That, that water is a Newtonian fluid. So is uh, glycol, I think, and uh, a few other fluids. If the ratio is not linear, as in it's a curve, then the fluid is called non-Newtonian. Taking the simplest relationship between shear stress and shear rate, looking at a Newtonian fluid first, water, oil, and glycerine 
water, oil, and glycerine are Newtonian fluids. Now, the viscosity is uh, usually um, the uh, Greek letter mu. Tau is the uh, shear stress, and gamma, which is this uh, symbol here, is the shear rate. Now, if you're plotting on, shear stress is on the y-axis, shear rate is on the x-axis. Uh, the viscosity is described by this line, the viscosity of the Newtonian fluid. And it's uh, ar arrived at by dividing your, uh, sh your differential stress by your differential rate. Your, so the, the slope of that line is defined by um, shear stress over shear rate, tau over gamma. And the slope, is all, the slope is always a straight line, but it actually varies. That, that, the, the actual slope, it will remain straight for a Newtonian fluid, but the, the, it will vary depending on pressure and temperature quite often. Now, rearranging that equation, um, <coughs> if, if, therefore, if, if you basically know the viscosity of, of the Newtonian fluid in this case, um, and you know the rate at which you are moving it, you can then work out the shear stress. And it's this sort of relationship that allows us to determine the pressure. What I was talking about previously, um, if we know the viscosity and we know the rate at which we're trying to move the fluid or the rate at which the fluid is moving, then we can determine the stress or basically the force necessary to, the force you need to apply to that fluid to get it to move at that rate will be determined by the viscosity. And the relationship, you can, you can see that uh, the more viscous this fluid, um, the, the, the higher this uh, mu value becomes, the more viscous or the thicker the fluid becomes, the higher the shear stress that you need to apply to get it to move at the same, any, any given rate. So if you wanted it to move at this rate, if you increase mu, then you'd have to, the slope of the line would increase up here. So it would become more viscous. Um, <clears throat> An increase in viscosity basically means the line starts to um, become steeper, meaning that you actually need to apply a higher, a higher force to get it to actually to move it at the same at the same rate. So you could actually relate that. Uh, it's not directly related, but you could, you could relate that to uh, pressure and flow rate. Even say that to if you increase your flow rate, uh, you'll have a higher a higher pressure. Or you, or you require a higher, a higher pressure. You, you require a higher, a larger amount of energy input from the pumps to uh, pump a fluid at a higher rate than you do to pump a fluid at a lower rate. Um, that's, that's the sort of relationship we're talking about. And these, that's for a Newtonian fluid, which is the, the simplest form of fluid. Uh, we'll start talking about non-Newtonian fluids now, and we'll see that the, the, the relationship isn't quite as straightforward as that. As I mentioned, if the ratio is not linear, then the fluid is called non-Newtonian. And drilling fluids, most drilling fluids are non-Newtonian. Now, uh, non-Newtonian fluids are anything that, that are off the straight line, which is this blue line here. It can be either of these two red lines. We've got a pseudo-plastic fluid, which basically curves above the uh, red line. And we've got what's called a dilatant fluid, which curves below the red line. So we can actually classify we can actually classify these red lines into, well, basically a shear thickening fluid, as in the more you shear it, the faster you shear it, the thicker it actually gets. Its viscosity actually changes along a curve. It doesn't, go, it doesn't just linearly increase like a Newtonian fluid. It becomes thicker. So the, the, the more you agitate that fluid, the faster you, faster you pump it or the, the more you move it, the quicker you move it, the, more, the, the thicker it gets. Therefore, the, 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 more, the more you need to more force you need to apply to it to get it to move any, any faster. And blood happens to be a dilatant fluid. Um, in our industry, um, in the oil industry, basically all, all, every fluid I can, I, we, we, we'd never be using a dilatant fluid because uh, obviously you couldn't pump it fast enough because the faster you tried to pump it, the more pressure you would have to impart and you'd never get it out of the, you'd never get it down the string. What we actually use are shear thinning fluids as opposed to shear thickening fluids, and these are pseudoplastic fluids. As you can see, um, as you pump it, it needs uh, a lot of force to start it moving. But as as it as it starts moving, as it uh, as it shears basically, as the rate increases, you, the, the this curve starts to level off to a more straight line, a, a more linear relationship. 
So it becomes almost like a Newtonian fluid up at the higher shear rates. But at, at the start, it's a, it's a definite curve. So that would be a pseudoplastic fluid. And the important thing to note from, from this graph is that uh, in, bo in, in most cases, the variation is, is, is actually a curve. In all cases, when we're talking about um, drilling fluids, the, the relationship's actually a curve. It's not a straight line. <clears throat> so now we understand the, the relationship of shear stress to shear rate, and, it actually, and that, that relationship actually describes the viscosity. And we're now ready to move on to examine the flow models that we actually have access to in our, in our software. <clears throat> 